Good morning. Just as a matter of introduction, my name is Jonathan Ingram. I do the work of an evangelist with the Parkview Christian Church in Plainville, Indiana, which is about four hours south of here. It's in southwest Indiana. I am accompanied on this trip by my wife, Leanne, my children, Andrea and Barrick, my father, Paul Ingram, some of you already know, he's been to previous um, renewals before. He will be bringing testimony this afternoon. You also may remember my mother, Joan Ingram, gave testimony at last year's event in North Carolina. And uh, bless her soul, she finished her course at the end of January this year, and now she is singing a new song, Dressed in Robes of Righteousness. Amen. One of the members of the congregation which I serve asked me about this event, and I certainly know what Brother Aaron was talking about. Sometimes it is not the easiest thing to explain uh, this event. After my message on Sunday morning, I said, you heard the message. Now imagine that times 14. <laughs> what you have for those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness is what we call an all-day buffet. Yeah. <laughs> and we have precedent for this in the scriptures because in Acts chapter 28, it says that the people were coming to the Apostle Paul in large numbers and he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and he was trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning to evening. We've got precedent. What I want to know is if we have some hungry people here today. Let us give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness, for his wonders to the sons of men. He has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul. He has filled with what is good. Amen. Brothers and sisters, my prayer is that today you will be constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. And as I like to think of this in my... Uh, slightly humorous way, but certainly no facetiousness intended at all. I'm just going to think of these five messages today as breakfast, brunch, lunch, dinner, and that wonderful snack before bedtime. We have a shared subject these three days, which is the will of God. But each preacher develops a different aspect of that subject. Thus, the goal of this message, according to 1 Peter 4.2, is to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Amen. To better understand a passage of Scripture, I often find myself falling back on those six essential questions asked by every good investigative reporter. Who, what, when, where, how and why. So I want to begin by breaking down 1 Peter 4.2 using those queries. To whom is this being addressed? According to verse 1 of this chapter, yourselves. And we may trace the antecedent for this pronoun all the way back to the first two verses of this epistle where Peter addresses his letter to those who reside as aliens who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Amen. In other words, Peter's words are addressed to Christians, to those who bear Christ's name, and my prayer is that each soul here this morning is bound to the one on whom God bestowed the name which is above every name because there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name by which we must be saved. Amen. Now, what is the subject of our text? To live according to 1 Peter 4.2. 
The word live, life, comes from the Greek word bios. And this has been used as a prefix for many English words which help us to understand the word. For example, biology, which is the study of life. Or biography, which is a written account of a life. So now we have to determine what is life according to this passage. What does it mean to live? Well, unfortunately, that question cannot be answered at this stage without further information because you and I both know that life and living mean different things to different people. For example, according to Luke chapter 8, in which Christ explains the parable of the sower, the seed which fell among the thorns, and of course the seed is the word of God, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they're choked with worries and riches and the pleasures of this life, and they bring no fruit to maturity. So for some, life consists solely of material goods and physical pleasures. Now the prodigal son of Luke 15 at one time defined life in this manner because verse 12 of that chapter tells us that the son said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So the scriptures tell us that he divided his wealth The word is bios, his life. He divided his wealth between them. And I'm sure that every one of us knows full well what that younger son went out and accomplished with his newfound life. Wasn't a pretty sight. But on the other hand, we have scriptures like 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 2 through 4 that urge all those who wear Christ's great name to lead a tranquil and a quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So therefore, two different aspects of this issue In order to determine what kind of a life our main text is suggesting we lead, we've got to continue with our questions. Who? Christians. What? They are to live. When? The rest of the time. Where? In the flesh. Now these phrases help us to define the boundaries of the living that we are to be doing. And at least we don't have to look back. Just as the apostle testified in Philippians 3, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And that future prize will indeed be glorious. But right now, we're still in the flesh. Thus, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as son, the redemption of our body. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we're seeking the city which is to come. Who? Christians. What we are to live. When, where, the rest of the time in the flesh. How? That's our next question. How are we to live? For indeed, while we're in this tent, we groan being burdened because we don't want to be unclothed, but to be clothed in order that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. That's what we want. That's what we're looking for. So finally we're given the information we need in our verse. Finally it's made clear to us how we should live. No longer for the lusts of flesh, but for the will of God. This brings us to the heart of this message. You and I know very well there are so many in this world who claim to be Christians. So many who will tell you that they are living for God. 
We see those around us who will turn on their Christian radio stations in the morning. They'll drink their morning coffee from their prayer of Jabez coffee mug. Then they get dressed and put the cross around their neck. They'll put on their what would Jesus do bracelet, get out their witness wear t-shirt, and drive to work with a car bumper sticker that says, my boss is a Jewish carpenter all the while convinced that they are a Christian and that's all there is to it. Is that the truth? Is that what it means to live for God? Not according to our text. Very clearly we are told we are to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men but for the will of God. The answer that we are given is twofold. First, our will has to be put to death. Then and only then can God's will be brought to life. Let's look a little closer at this framework for real life. Our will must be put to death. Why is that? Because the scriptures tell us that no one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll hold to one and despise the other. You cannot live with two wills in one body. In fact, if you do so, the psychiatrist calls the condition schizophrenia. I refer you specifically to the second definition of schizophrenia according to Webster's Ninth New Collegiate Dictionary. The presence of mutually contradictory or antagonistic parts or qualities. That which is contradictory together. That which is antagonistic together. Or as the Apostle Paul put it, what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? Therefore, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. In case you haven't been told, you have a free will. You can choose to have your way. Or you can choose to let God have His way. But you cannot do both. Well, then let it be my will, some will say. I'm going to do things my way and no one's going to tell me otherwise. Oh my, how dangerous are such words. You see, according to the Proverbs, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The way of a fool's always right in his own eyes. Jesus told us in advance that some would not listen. Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? He asked. I say to you, many prophets and kings wish to see the things which you see, and they, and they did not see them. To hear the things which you hear, and they didn't hear them. Brothers and sisters, this is exactly what Satan wants. He wants you to be devoid of the word. And he wants you to perish. And those who do will do so because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Amen. But that is not God's will. He is patient towards us, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Therefore, shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? Amen. According to our text, first, we are to live no longer for the lust of men. Amen. Now, James gives us a very good reason why in the first chapter of his epistle, Telling us that each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. And then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Actually, that's exactly what has happened to each and every one of us for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. 
Rest assured, just as we are told in 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we need to face the facts. According to Ephesians, the second chapter, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires, the will of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. Now, I don't know about you. When I hear phrases like children of wrath, that kind of makes me nervous because I don't want to be on the receiving end of God's wrath. The Bible tells me it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God for our God is a consuming fire. So in other words, we need to heed Jesus' wonderful words of life that we heard last night from Matthew 16, 24. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Amen. The apostle testified in Romans chapter 8, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. So then, brethren, we're under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. If you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. And isn't that what we want to do? Don't we want to live? That's why we were buried with him through baptism into death. In order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we will also be with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. Know this. Our old self was crucified with him that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Don't you believe what the scriptures tell you? If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. You see the contrast? To truly live... The old man, the body of sin, the selfish will, it's got to go. Amen. Because we, if we really want to call ourselves Christians, are to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Amen. This I say therefore and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. Now I want you to understand that the purpose, the will of those who are outside of Christ is futile. It's futile. It's of no use. You find someone who says, I'm a self-made man. They're wrong. They're wrong. They're darkened in their understanding. They're excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they've become callous, and they've given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But the apostle says, you didn't learn Christ in this way. Amen. If indeed you've heard of him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God and has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Amen. Brother Bolt, I enjoyed that message on sanctification my goodness, how we need in this nation, in the church, sanctified saints. We are to live the rest of the time in the flesh. No longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. 
I, one of my favorite passages in scripture is Jesus' prayer from John chapter 17. John 17, 17, Jesus prayed to his father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. We ought to know by now, especially any of you have been around Brother Given for very long at all, that in the exercise of his will, God brought us forth by the word of truth. So that we might be as it were the first fruits among his creatures. You see, for those in Christ, there is no more old man. He's dead, he's buried. Then, finally, when that occurs, God's will can be brought to life within us. Christ said something very difficult for many to hear, to understand, in Matthew chapter 7. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we perform miracles in your name? Then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now that passage of scripture tells me a couple of things. First, it tells me there are many people who sincerely believe that they are living according to God's will. But it also tells me that such people are sincerely wrong. Living for the will of God isn't about living our life, doing our will, and then tacking Christ's name on the back end of the event to ensure its holiness. Living for the will of God means that you're hungry and thirsty for righteousness. It means that you seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. It means that you're striving to be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Amen. To live for the will of God means that we pray as we've been taught to pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me ask you this. If we cannot, or more to the point, will not do His will here on earth, how are we ever going to expect to do it in heaven? Amen. The Bible is a book of contrasts from beginning to end. Light and darkness. Sin and righteousness. Good and evil. In Genesis 2.25, it's written that Adam and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. But only 10 verses later, Genesis 3.10, in answer to God's question, where are you? Adam answers by saying, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Now what I want to know is what happened in such a short time to change the way Adam and Eve saw themselves. Well, you know the answer to that as well as I do. They sinned. And Romans 6.23 assures us that the wages of sin is death. But, here comes the contrast, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus says the thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. Oh, there's the bad. But I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. Amen. Good contrast. Likewise, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We're a fragrance of Christ. I always wondered what that odor was. We're a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to the one an aroma from death to death, to the other an aroma from life to life. Contrast. Every contrast in the scriptures is designed for one purpose to show what life is like with Christ and without him with God and without him that's what the contrasts are there for so if you truly want to live for the will of God you're following in divine footsteps right there because in John 6, Jesus admitted, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Amen. 
Did he follow through? Absolutely. The apostle later testifies in Philippians 2 that Jesus humbled himself and he became obedient even to the point of death. You know, I suppose that that's the real question behind living for the will of God. Are we willing to humble ourselves and obey? If you'll remember in Acts chapter 13, God evaluated the life of one who claimed to be his servant. And he states, for the divine record, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Mm -hmm. Amen. Therefore, let those also who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what's right. Amen. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, that's not from the Father. It's from the world, and the world's passing away. And so are its lusts. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. Amen. I love what Jesus told that woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. No one left to condemn you, huh? Neither do I condemn you. Go your way. From now on, sin no more. Now, the reason I like that verse so much, especially in the context of this message, is the same Greek word is used in our main text, in our main text where we're told no longer to live for the lusts of men. No longer. Go and sin no more. No longer. So what I have to ask is, will you obey the Son of God when He tells you, don't sin anymore? Are you willing to obey that? And I find it interesting, in the next verse, John 8, 12, Jesus offers the eternal contrast once again because he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. There's our contrast. Now, I started this message by talking of questions. And I want to make sure that we cover all those questions. Who? We who are in Christ. What? Our work is to live. When? Where? The rest of the time that we have in the flesh. How are we to live? No longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Well, it seems to me, if my count is correct, the only question that remains unanswered is the why. Why should we live for the will of God rather than for the lusts of men? Now, fortunately, 1 Peter 4.1 gives us the context for our answer and is certainly a fitting conclusion to this message. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, Arm yourselves with the same purpose because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now there's a couple of things I want to talk about briefly in that verse to help us to understand 1 Peter 4 2. First is arm yourselves. Now I like that word. I understand that phrase. To arm myself means to pick up a weapon. Therefore, says Romans 6, don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. Don't go on presenting the members of your body as instruments. The Greek word is weapons. As weapons of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your members as weapons of righteousness to God. Boy, I tell you guys, how many times have we watched the action movies and watched some Rambo or Stallone or whoever it might be and say, boy, what would it be like to be the perfect weapon? But you know, in Christ Jesus, even from the lowest to the greatest, we can each be weapons of righteousness to God. Now, Paul records an interesting biographical note regarding the apostles in 2 Corinthians 6 because he says in everything we're commending ourselves as servants of God in much endurance in afflictions in hardships in distresses 
in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth. In the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness. Arm yourselves. That's what we've been told. By the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. You look through that passage of scripture. My goodness, the trials that these men of faith experienced. But you know, that's life in Christ. That's life in Christ. And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Amen. Boy, I sure could identify with Brother Maddox's message. Such a great battle that we're in. And the only weapon that we've been given, the only weapon necessary for our survival and victory is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. For even though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. Our wep the weapons of our warfare... Remember, arm yourselves. They're not of the flesh. They're divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We're destroying speculations. And every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought, every thought. Now what did it say earlier? Arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Literally the word there is thoughts, the same thoughts. Taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You see, in living for the will of God, the bottom line is this. Are you willing to let your will die so that God's will can live? Are you willing to humble yourself and be obedient even to the point of death on a cross? What we read earlier, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, your thoughts, your purpose, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the... Hard fact is this, the night is almost gone and the day is at hand. So let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let's behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, because our goal is to be sanctified. Instead, we're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Amen. May each of us say, fellow Christians, with Christ, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God.